Welcome to the afternoon track um, at PHP, uh, the PHP conference in Dresden. Um, I'm going to talk to you about shit. <laughs> well, no, not about shit, but um, about how to handle shit. I'm not going to talk about code quality. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, actually, how to handle beers or uh, party poppers, or crowns, or money, or whatever you want. Actually, I'm going to talk to you about how to handle any character out there. So whoever thought uh, this talk was about something else uh, is now free to leave. Everyone else, welcome to the show. Uh, short introduction, who am I? I'm Andreas. I'm a PHP developer for some time. Um, I co-organize uh, the user group in Frankfurt. I'm that guy that somehow came, uh, had the idea to do a map of all the user groups. So if you don't know where your nearest user group is, head over to php.ug and have a look. I do maintain some open source libraries. I'm a uh, contributor to some open source things. And that was uh, where I first came into contact with all that shit about encodings and stuff like that. So far to me, before I can tell you about encodings and stuff, I need to do some definitions so that we all know what we're talking about. Who of you knows what a glyph is? Okay, some hands, cool. Some don't know. Okay, this is a glyph, and this is one, and this is a glyph. And even though these three look absolutely identical, those are three different glyphs. A glyph is a visual representation of a character. And m multiple characters that are used in one language are called a character set. A character set is a collection of characters that is used by, well, perhaps even multiple languages. Who of you knows some character sets? Well, I think most of you know this one. That's a character set, ASCII. We come to that later. ISO 88591 is a character set for Western European languages. Um, Unicode is a character set for all languages. That's what we're going to talk about later. So fine, we have some characters. We have a character set. Um, but we're talking about computers here. Computers can't understand characters. Computers only understand numbers. And so we need a way to tell the computer this character is represented by this number. And to do that, we have something else called an encoding. An encoding could, for example, be ASCII. Oh, we had that before, haven't we? Um, it could also be, oh, wait a minute, there is an, a mixture sometimes of character set and encoding. And this will, or I will show you soon why this is a bit of a problem. On the other hand, we also have an encoding, for example, like UTF-8. Or, well, actually, an encoding is also Morse code. Yeah, that's not encoding to a number, but it's encoding to something that is transportable via something. Semaphore actually also is an encoding. Who of you know semaphore? Okay, at least some. Cool. So a character set is not the same as an encoding. That is very important to remember. And sometimes that got mixed up. So how, the, how did all of that evolve? Because to understand that, we need to understand how it happened to come into life. Um, so we need to do a bit of history. Sorry about that. Um, in the early days of computers, uh, we had some computers in different locations. They weren't connected, so everyone, every um, creator of a computer developed their own character set, their own encoding, how a character was represented by um, 
by a number that was completely different between different computers. Even uh, different versions of computers had completely different encodings. That was fine as long as we didn't exchange data between them. And in the beginning of the, or end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, suddenly people were starting with things like ARPANET and transferring files between computers. Um, so people had to think about how can we actually standardize that. And as that happened in, uh, in the United States, uh, a thing called, what's going on here? A thing called the American Standard Code of Information Interchange was developed. Well, the American Standard Code of Information Interchange is pretty easy. Um, memory was very expensive, so let's see how we can get the maximum out of our limited resources. So um, let's try to fit all the characters we need into 7-bit. I'm quite sorry, we will talk a lot about bits and bytes. Um, I hope you can follow me with that later on. So what do we need for, uh, for this ASCII standard? Okay, we of course need some capital letters. We need some uh, small case letters. We need some numbers. Uh, we need some uh, special signs. And well, we, we also need some very special signs that were needed in the early days to, for, for computer interaction. Oh damn, 120, 80, 128 places are taken up pretty fast. Well, okay, no problem at all. I mean, it worked for the Americans, didn't it? And if you um, try to encode hello world into numbers or into hexadecimal, well, okay, uh, I can do an echo hello world, pass it to hex stamp, and then I see, okay, 48 is the hex character for the capital H. Uh, 65 is the, uh, is the hex value for the lower E and so on. So that's how those letters, those characters are converted into machine code. Fine, the Americans were happy. Computers evolved and evolved and evolved and suddenly, um, well, they also came, uh, there also came some other countries uh, and that had computers and they said, well, what about our pound sign? We want that in there. Yes. Uh, or, or some other uh, special characters that weren't in, in the ASCII. And, and what about, uh, hey, sorry, I'm German. What about our umlauts? And um, well, the, the Nordic people also said, we have some special characters we want in there as well. And so on, and so on. So there were some things missing. Um, well, wait a minute. What about Greek language? Polish. What about Polish? What about Cyrillic? What about Hebrew? Um, that doesn't work like that, does it? So, okay. Well, that's rather easy. I mean, if, you, if you've recognized these are 128, uh, 128 characters as well. So ASCII is a seven-bit character uh, uh, encoding. By adding one additional bit, we get another 128 points, 128 spaces where we can put something in it. So why not use those additional 128 for, well, Western European languages or for Greek language? or for Cyrillic, or for Polish. And that was the birth of the ISO 8859 character set family. It's ASCII compatible in that the, the first 128 characters are the same as ASCII, but the second 128 are different. Well, um, and there are different subsets of that character set. Those are ASCII, uh, ISO 88591 for Western European languages, or two for Middle European languages, which would include Polish, or three for Southern European languages, or four for Northern European languages, five for Cyrillic, seven for Greek. There is no sixth 
by the way, um, and so on. And then there was this weird thing in 2001 happening. What happened in 2001? In 2001, the European Union got a new currency. And damn, the euro sign was not in that character set. So there is now ISO 885915, which is a ISO 885991 plus, you guessed it, the euro sign. That's the only difference. Um, there are other names for that character, uh, for that encoding, um, which is, for example, Windows 1252. Um, actually, the first uh, 36 bits are, uh, the first 36 places are a bit different in there. Latin 1, for example, is ISO 88591, or IBM 819, or code page 819. But you have to be careful with this ISO 88591 family, because if, for example, you have this character, or this machine code, C4, what character is that? What character does that translate to? Of course, it's an A. It's a German umlaut A, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, almost. It's a fee in ISO 88595, which is Greek. Or this nice little character, which I have no idea what it is. Whoever wants to enlighten me, feel free. What? De. De. Okay, thank you. Or it, it's a, uh, a delta. Or it's, uh, well, another weird character. I think that's Thai. <laughs> or it might even not be defined at all. So if you have a, a file in the character set of the family 8859, one, uh, 8859, you have to tell the other side which actually character set is it. Otherwise, you will not get information out of it. Well, you get, will get information out of it, but not the one you wanted. And, well, that's fine. But what about Chinese or Japanese or Korean languages? As far as I know, you need at least 3,000 signs to be able to, well, kind of read stuff. So those languages have more than 10,000 different characters. How do we put that into 258 code points? No way. At least not that I know of. So wouldn't it be cool to have all the characters available without having hassle? Would it be cool? Yes. yes, it would be cool, of course. And that's the point where Unicode enters. Yeah, Unicode! Unicode is a character set. Unicode is ISO 885591 compatible. And therefore, it's also ASCII compatible as a character set. Um, yeah. The version one was developed in 1991. And it contained 65,536 code points. 65,000 characters. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? So that definitely is enough for, well, European languages, American languages, Chinese fits in there, Japanese fits in there, Korean fits in there, a lot of different languages fits in there. Perfect. In version two, they extended that to more than one million character sets, uh, one million code points, which is pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> by now, or in 2010, version six came out. And this version six was a very or is, is really a milestone of Unicode. Because up to that point in 2010, I mean, we're talking about 19 years since the invention or the, the first release of Unicode. In these 19 years, no one actually cared about Unicode. There were some geeks, yeah, but everyone else was like, I oh, know, ISO 8859 is fine. But then suddenly we had phones, with messenger applications. And we, in 2010, there were emojis. And we suddenly could send emojis. And since then, everyone awaits 
like what not for the next release of Unicode because apart from, yes, there are three complete languages in there and there are some bug fixes in there, there are also 15 new uni uh, emojis. Awesome, isn't it? Yes. yes. <laughs> How does Unicode work internally? Unicode um, has defined 16 so-called planes, 16 pages, if you want to. Each of them has 65,536 code points. So Unicode version 1 had just one of these planes. And in version 2, they said, ah, oh, well, we might need some more planes, so let's add them. Okay. Remember that 1991, that we'll, we will need that later on with that version 1. And um, those code points are defined using two bytes within a plane. So I have 65, more than 65,000 code points. Each code point is defined by two bytes. Perfect. There is also a private use area within the, the first plane. Where could that come in? Who of you uses that private use area? One. I'm pretty sure all of you use it. <coughs> Who of you is not using Font Awesome? One person. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, two two persons. That was another one. Um, Font Awesome, for example, uses the private use area of Unicode to store the characters that you have in Font Awesome. And all the most commonly used characters are within the first plane, which makes it rather easy because you just need two bytes to define them and not also an additional byte to define which plane they are on. Yes, but there is also a but. There are, of course, multiple ways to define one character. How does that work? Um, and therefore, Unicode has a way of normalizing characters. For example, the end with a tilde on top can be defined in two different ways. You can either use the, SK, uh, the, the uh, ISO 88591 representation, which is one part, or you can say, no, it's an N, and it is a tilde character, and we just combine those two. Um, yeah. How to normalize that in searches, that is also defined in Unicode. And there are also multiple ways to compare characters. Uh, that is also defined within the Unicode. Okay, so that was pretty theoretical now, wasn't it? So how does such a plane actually look like? Let's have a look at the first plane of Unicode. That's it. We have those first two black boxes, or the first three black boxes. The first box with 00 is uh, ISO 8859 1. And uh, in the next two boxes, there are some other Roman or Latin characters, and so on. You see the whole stuff. Um, notice this area. We need that later on. Uh, or uh, over here, this one. Um, yeah, and, and the private use area at the bottom. Does that make sense now for most of you? For all of you? Who has questions so far? Yes? Uh, why are some of the boxes, uh, why do some of the boxes have um, multiple colors? Um, because in, in, for example, in this, is it A6? I think it is an A6. Um, there are different types of, of characters in there. I mean, you have in, in each one of these boxes, you have 265 characters. And, well, 128 of these characters might be one type which in this case would be uh, non-Latin European scripts. Um, no idea actually what that means at the moment. Uh, and the other ones would belong to some African script. It's just a matter of aligning the stuff. And the white boxes actually are free. They are not used at the moment. And they probably might not be used at all. So, Unicode, some examples. The A, capital A, uh, is defined as Unicode character 0041. So it's the, 40, uh, the, the 41st character in the first box, top left. The end with a tilde, as I told you, could either be defined as OOF1, being the 
F1 character in uh, in the ISO 8859 one character set, or as a combination of an N and a tilde. This character, for example, is defined, yeah, it's, it's OE04. So it's in the uh, 15th block, the fourth character. And that emoji, we know from the beginning, is defined as 01F4A9. The other representation, I'll show you later. The 01 at the beginning here means it's not in the first plane. It's on the second plane. That's why we need three bytes to describe that one. So Unicode is a character set. How do we encode that character set? Because a character set is not the same as an encoding. Any ideas what would be a character, uh, an encoding for Unicode? Well, who of you has heard of UTF-32? Some. Who of you has heard of UTF-16? Some more. Who of you uses UTF-16 on a regular basis? Every one of you. UTF-16, uh, we'll come to that later. UTF-8, anyone heard of that? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, UTF-32 means uh, each character is defined by four bytes. We've seen we have we need two bytes for the uh, for the location within the plane. We need one byte for which plane we are in. So we have three bytes. If you have if we need four bytes, we always have one byte empty, which is a complete waste of space. So no one is actually using that. Purely academic. UTF-16, on the other hand, uses two bytes for each character. Yes, it always uses two bytes, always. But that means they can only def give information from the first plane. Because as soon as we leave the first plane, we need a third byte to tell which plane we are on. That's used with, uh, by Windows, it's used by Mac OS, it's used by Java. And Java is the main thing here. Uh, because Java was also developed in the 90s, beginning of the 90s. And when they started, they said, yeah, well, let's use UTF-16 because, I mean, hey, Unicode is cool. We use Unicode because it's a new and shiny feature. But, I mean, they only have one plane. They only have 60, more than, a bit more than 65,000 characters. So, hey, two bytes, perfect. It's enough. Yeah, well. And then they started that and developed with that. And in 1991, should hit the fan. UTF-16 also has a problem because it's not stream safe. I'll show you later why. And I also always need to know which byte is the first byte because some operating systems think it is cool if, we ha if you have two bytes that the lower information is actually in the second byte and not in the first byte or the other way around. And that's why you need a byte order marker. Um, you can also add a B at the end because it blows off a lot of things. So, but how can you, uh, UTF-16 encode emojis? I mean, we're talking about Mac OS. And iOS is nothing else than Mac OS, so they're using UTF-16. But I, I mean, on an iPhone, I can use Emojis, can't I? So how do they do that? Well, sorry for bits and bytes now. They use this small gray area I've shown you at the beginning, or within that first plane. They use so-called supplementary characters. They do the following. They use this character, which has three bytes. They subtract a bit mask so that we are left with F602. So far, are you with me? Uh, OK. That is the binary representation of that. That's 20 bits. So why not use the first 10 bit and add them to 
OXD8100. Uh, so that gives me, in that case, OXD8 3D. And the second 10 bit we add to uh, DC00, which leaves me with DE02. So this emoji in UTF16 has four bytes. So as soon as we leave the first plane, UTF-16 always uses four byte. Whom have I lost? Okay, good. Any questions so far? Why are you listening to that? Yes. Uh, why not just migrate to the UTF-32? Um, well, because they decided to use UTF-16, and that means you have just have two bytes, so you need to of course, you could extend that to UTF-32, uh, to, to UTF but at what point would you start with UTF-32 within your file? You, you, you see the problem? Okay. So let's have a look at UTF-8. UTF-8 uses between one and four bytes. So it can use all code points from Unicode, and it can even use more. So if Unicode at one point would decide, ah, you know, 17 planes, it's not enough, we need more, no problem for UTF-8, uh, not at all. It's mainly used on Linux and, well, in the web, because it's stream safe, we see why. You can use a byte order marker, but it's not necessary. And please don't use one, otherwise some people will have fun. And most probably it will be you three weeks later. So how does that look like? Okay, so let's have a look at the single byte. If, when I have a, a single byte character. A single byte always starts with the zero bit, which is followed by the ASCII code of the character I want to encode. Easy, isn't it? So A would be represented with 0100001. Again, sorry for the bits and bytes. So that's ASCII. All ASCII characters will always be represented by a single byte character in Unicode, uh, in, in UTF-8. What about multi-byte characters? Okay, so each byte, each byte in a multi-byte character starts with a one. And then it's followed by a one for each follow-up byte in the first byte. Or a zero for the follow-up bytes. What? Who could follow me? Nobody. Nobody, yeah. I can imagine that. Let's, let's have a look how that looks like. Okay, so this is the, a single byte character. We have a zero at the beginning and then we have the payload. This is a two byte character. We have 110 for the first one and we have a 10 for the second one, again followed by the payload. How does a three byte character look like? We have three ones and an O, and then two bytes that start with one O. And guess how a four byte character looks like? Exactly. And the X always is the payload. So that's the main thing at the beginning. So how do we now get information into that? How do we use the payload? Sorry, Does, is that better? Probably a bit. Okay. Um, let's have a look at an example. What did I do wrong? No idea. Oh. Uh, let's try that. Okay. So if we use an, a capital A, that would be the Unicode code point U plus OOC4, which translates into OO11000. One one oh 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 one oh oh. Sorry, we have to do that. And uh, <laughs> yes, I could perhaps do a bit more. Yeah. Um, so and then I add that bit stuff as something is going on here. Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, I add that as payload into these free spaces into the X's. Yes, I have three empty spaces that are not used at all. But that doesn't matter. 
I just add my stuff in there, perfect. I told you it's stream safe. Why is it stream safe? Does this work? Is that a valid character? Or a valid, whatever valid? No. No, it's not. Because suddenly we have a follow up byte, but no start byte. What do we do? We do nothing. Is that valid? No. Nope. No, it's not. Because we have a start byte for a two byte character, but we have no follow up byte. And in this case, we have the same. We have a, three by, a start byte for a three byte character, but only have only one follow up byte. The second one is missing, so it doesn't work. All, th all these combinations will result in this character. Who has encountered that? Thank you very much. Okay, so you're, you're still awake. Great. Yes, we're finished with the basics. Let's have a look at PHP or at code. How can you use UTF-8 in code? Pretty easy, always use UTF-8. And always means actually always. Save your source code files in UTF-8. Set the default char set in your PHP ini. Don't assume it is set, have a look at it. Set the content type to, wait a minute, who spots the error? Exactly. UTF-8 is not a char set, it's an encoding. But due to history, where it just mixed up, where it was one and the same, somehow that char set, or that enco actually encoding was called char set in here. Set your accept char set to UTF-8. Add an accept char set attribute to your forms. Use the iconf and the MB string extensions. Come to that later. And check out your locale settings. So, okay. Now all my stuff is in UTF-8. Perfect. Do I have to think about anything else? Database. Databases, we come to that later. Before we come to databases, we need to stop, put stuff into the database. We need to get stuff. So we have user input. Can we assume that it, that is UTF-8? No, we can't. So actually make sure that it is UTF-8. Um, I would recommend um, using the MB detect encoding to guess what encoding we are handling with, and then use the iconf function to convert your stuff from your guessed encoding to UTF-8. And if you use it like this with UTF-8 translate ignore, it will try to, well, it will try to convert it to UTF-8. If it can't do it, if it can't convert a character, it will try to transliterate it. And if that doesn't work, it will just ignore it. So if you have broken input, it will just ignore those broken characters. You will lose information, but only a bit of information, and otherwise it will just blow up and say, I can't handle this because there is one character wrong. And that's not much fun. The alternative way would be to use MB convert encoding, which internally does the guessing part and then converts it to UDF8. Are there other ways to convert encoding in PHP? Okay. Do I see? No? What about UTF-8 decode and UTF-8 encode? Please, don't use it. Because that only works with ISO 88591. It will not work with any other character set, and you can't expect user input to be actually in that encoding. For string manipulations, you should always use the MB string functions. There are, for almost all string functions, there is an MB string function. So for example, in this case, for string length, there is also an MB string length. And you see the difference, which, makes more, which one makes more sense? Exactly, the lower one. It always depends on what you want. There are use cases where string length actually makes sense. But most of the time, you don't want to count the bytes of the string, but you want to count the characters within the string. And especially when you're using Unicode, there is another one, there is the grapheme functions. Because 
emojis are weird. This family emoji actually is four emojis combined to one emoji. So it actually is seven characters. And if you do an MB string length, you will get a seven. But what you actually want is the grapheme string length in that case, which gives you, yes, this is one emoji. Yes. One caveat, though. Who of you knows about function overloading? OK, those of you who don't know about function overloading, don't use it. So you didn't miss anything. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's just weird. There was a question over there. Vim, was that you? Yeah, um, how, do you how do you detect like that uh, for emoji group? Is there a way to see, like, oh, in this case, I need to use the graphene, or in this case, I need to use the MB string? Well, the easiest one is uh, use grapheme string length and use MB string length, and if they differ, you know you had one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's actually, yeah, well, no, that's actually the only one, uh, the only way to really find out. If you're using regex, use the, min, uh, use the U modifier to um, be safe on that side. So far, so good. Any questions on that, on that part? Yes? The graphing string lab, will it also count normal strings? Yeah. It, it, will, it, it does the same as MB string length plus added grapheme functionality. So Twitter should be using that? Probably you should be using that. It depends on what you want. There was another question? No. No? OK. So we did the easy part now. Oh, yeah, sorry? Uh, actually, I encountered that Internet Explorer L, the 11, doesn't support the U like, for regex. So what's the use for That's a JavaScript problem, is it? Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know at the moment. Um, Just don't use Internet Explorer 11. Don't, don't use Internet Explorer 11, yes, thank you. That, that's <laughs> that's not prob probably not feasible. So that was the easy part. Now we come to, ta-da, MySQL. So we've left PHP. Well, MySQL, what can I say? Up to version eight, the default locale was la uh, the default chart set was Latin, and the default collation was Swedish. So characters was compared how they are compared in Sweden. Yeah, why not? I mean, you can do that. Um, yes, the collation defines how things are sorted. In Swedish, that means the A with a circle on top comes after the Z. Uh, also the the German umlaut A comes after the Z. In Germany, we expect the, A, the umlaut A to be right within the, uh, right after AE. But hey, and uh, CI is case insensitive and BIN is case sensitive, so depending on what you do, uh, you probably should use case insensitive handling. But the most annoying thing in MySQL is that it uses different encodings, or can use different encodings for different parts. So, MySQL uses an encoding for the server. It also uses an encoding for the client. Those can be different. It uses an encoding, its own encoding for the database, but it also uses its own encoding for the table, and you guess what? It also uses its own encoding for the fields. And, and that's the fun thing, it also uses its own encoding for the connection. And you have to set all six of them, you should set all six of them to UTF-8. Well, you can check how to, uh, what, what they are currently set to with the show variables like character set and then you get a long, uh, an interesting list. And I hope everything is set to UTF-8. You can put that into your mycon file to set the server to character set UTF-8. And you can put that in to set your client to UTF-8. And when you create a database, you should create a database with the default character set defined. Please do not guess what 
the database administrator thought was appropriate. Be explicit. Set it to UTF-8. And if you create a table, you should also set the character set. You do not necessarily need to set the character set for the field because when you create a table like this, it will automatically use the same character set for the fields that you set for the table. But probably you should, just to be explicit. And the first thing when you connect to a database to do is send a first statement, set names UTF-8. Because otherwise, your connection will still be initialized with the default value, which is exactly Latin 1, Swedish collation. Um, yes. And then you can try that. Uh, you could also do, that, do it like this with, when you use PDO. Um, just set the char set to UTF-8 MB4 and that will automatically set the connection to UTF-8 MB4. Wait a minute, UTF-8 MB4? I, I always set UTF-8. Well, MySQL is, uh, they, they did a very nifty thing. They said, yeah, well, okay, we, let's do UTF-8. But we have a problem there because uh, the maximum you can have in a, a char field is 255 characters. If you want to index that, um, yeah, well, that's perfect, but the maximum index size, at least with my ESAM tables, was uh, 700 and something bytes. What? 747. 747. So 255 multiplied by three, that works just like that. Very harsh, but it works. But UTF-8 can be four, four byte long. So that will be 255 multiplied by four. And now I'm way out of that range. So they said, well, okay. No one ever will use four bytes for Unicode. We just use three bytes. That's perfect, that's okay. Well, it turned out it wasn't okay because people suddenly wanted to store emojis within their database and everything blew up. And they said, ah, okay, we probably need a UTF-8 that actually has four bytes. So we, let's call that UTF-8 MB4. So if you're setting your database to a UMySQL to UTF-8, please use UTF-8 MB4. Because UTF-8 is, well, it's not what is advertised. So what happens when you forget the connection? When you forget to set the connection to UTF-8? Let's have a look. We are sending a German umlaut A. Sorry, we are doing binary here. Um, so the client has this nice bit thingy going. And it's, it says, OK, connection here. I have these bits for you. And the connection says, yeah, thank you very much. I'm sending them over. The client only said I have these bits. It didn't say I have one character. The connection then says, oh, thank you, I got some bits. Oh, those are 16 bits, so that must be two characters. Perfect. And then the server says, oh, thank you very much for those two characters. <laughs> but I'm set into UTF-8, so I probably should convert them to the proper UTF-8 characters, shouldn't I? Uh, yes, no. This is what is going to be stored. <laughs> Who of you has ever seen that? Thank you very much. What would, the other, what, would, what would be the other option? Use a real database. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, short recap. Use UTF-8 everywhere, anywhere. Uh, use the iconf and uh, especially the MB string functions. Don't use UTF 8D or encode. Don't use function overloading for the MB string functions. Teach your MySQL proper UTF 8, proper UTF 8, MB4. And remember that MySQL by default only uses three bytes. Any questions? No questions?
Okay. Yeah. Is it safe to uh, change the encoding of a database table? No. Uh, if it wasn't, you didn't add it. You can add it. Yeah. Yeah. You um, technically, you can do that. <laughs> no. But, but by this answer, you already guess you shouldn't probably. Yeah. Um, no. What you can do is if you have UTF-8 and you want to convert it to UTF-8 MB4, that is possible, but it will not work when you have set an index on that field. So you will need to remove that index, do the conversion, and re-index the field with an explicitly set key, uh, key length. Does that a bit answer your question? Was that, was that a yes or a no? Okay, that was a yes. Cool. Anyone else? Yes? I just want okay. So I just wanted to comment on that. If you have a field, uh, a max field size, and it's near the end, and you convert it to MB4, and it sources as a 4-bit, you actually can only store less. And MySQL will not tell you this, and then suddenly you will miss a bunch of data, and you have no idea how that happened. <laughs> Well, you have an idea how that happened. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't do it in Hashtag production experience. right away. I, I probably would first check that. So if there are no questions, thank you very much. <laughs>